all God's people said, amen. Well done. Let's have a welcome and a greeting time. Come on, welcomers. Good morning and welcome to worship. We are so glad you are worshiping with us. The past week, the four of us and about 150 other children participated in VBS here at FPC Waco. Zayden and Peyton are going to share their favorite parts of VBS. My favorite part of VBS was the songs. My favorite song was Whole Lot of Change. My favorite part of VBS was rec time because we played fun games like dodgeball, knockout, and capture the rhino. As you can see, we had a great time while we learned about God's goodness. If you are a guest with us this morning, if you are a guest with us in worship today, we want to ask you to fill out the tear-off section of your bulletin and either place it in the offering plate later in the service or stop by the Welcome Center desk in the foyer after the service. If you stop by the desk, we have an awesome gift for you. Now, as we continue in worship, please stand and greet those around you. Please join me in a reading from Psalm 119. Blessed are they whose ways are blameless, 
who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are they who keep your statutes and seek you with all their heart. I, I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Please join me in prayer. Our gracious God, on this Father's Day, we remember your faithfulness. Thank you for letting us walk with you each day. We know that you are with us in each and every moment. We thank you for fulfilling your promises and inspiring us with your goodness. In this moment, we come before you and lay our lives at your feet. May we continue to adore and worship you with all your, our hearts. May we always praise you and come to know you better. Today, as we join together in worship, may we sing of your greatness and wonder. Father, we adore you. Father, we love you. May we be guided by your light and mercy forever. Amen. I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's time and for those who are in Bible school this week, including the teenagers and grown-up people, you can join me too. Miss Holly this morning for our children's time is going to help us sing one of our Bible school songs. Yeah, come on kids, let's come on down. We'll just stand right here today. Robin, you can come too. All right.
morning. Well, as many of you know, uh, over the past few weeks, we've had several teams traveling uh, on various mission trips. One of them was to Durham, England, uh, one of them to Belfair, Washington, and the last to Ecuador. And all these trips overlapped to some degree. Uh, I want to invite you at the end of the month, you'll find this in your bulletin, there's an evening on June 30th when you're going to have an opportunity to hear reports from each of these trips. And uh, that's at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall on June 30th. But uh, over the next uh, th three Sundays, we want to give you just a short sneak preview of each of those trips and a brief recap. And so Sarah is here today uh, to tell you just a little bit about, about our Durham, England trip. And she'd just like to uh, tell you a little bit about uh, what happened there and, and share some experiences. So, Sarah. All right. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I've been going to FBC for three years now, and this is my second trip to England, so I'm really blessed. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to tell you first a little bit about kind of the structure of what we did while we were in England, and then I'll share a story about something I learned. Um, so yeah, so we, we had kind of two main um, sections of activities during the day. Uh, we would... Um, have the first slot from nine to uh, three in the afternoon, and then uh, we had a little break, and then we would uh, have other things that we did in the evenings. But uh, in the mornings, it was interesting. We kind of worked with every different possible age group. Um, we broke into different like mini teams, and um, so some people went at, to areas where uh, there were a lot of university students and had conversations with them and some stayed at the church, um, and uh, we had activities for kids, and we had um, coffee and tea, um, and we also um, just kind of had conversations with whoever was around. Um, and then in the evenings, we did events um, that were discussion-based. Um, so we did a talk on mental health and, and different things like that. Um, and, uh, Something that I learned on, on this trip, I mean, there was so much that it was kind of hard to choose what to talk about, but um, it was interesting to me, in the trainings that we did before the trip, um, Ryan and Andrew were talking to us about how uh, when someone is exploring faith, there's kind of three things that happen. They, um, they believe, they behave, and they belong. They, you know, believe in, uh, at some point, they believe in the gospel, um, they behave uh, like a Christian, they belong to the church. Um, but what they were telling us is, you know, it doesn't always happen in that order. It's not always believe first, then um, behave, and then belong. Actually, and especially like in this time, um, it, a lot of times it happens uh, in the opposite order maybe belonging happens first, then behaving, and then believing, or kind of, it, it can happen like in any order. Um, and that's something that I thought was a really interesting idea, but I'd never seen it happen before, and so it didn't really sink in. Um, but when we were on this trip, uh, we, we all got to know a um, young man named Daniel, um, and it was just really interesting because like, you know, we started just having a conversation with him, but then he he just kept showing up to all of the events. Like he would just spend all day with us and pretty soon he belonged as part of our team. And then, you know, he would be like, I would go back into the kitchen to do dishes and I would find him there doing dishes. Um, and he even like started going out with the teens that talk to university students and sharing the gospel or talking, starting conversations about the gospel, even though he wasn't a Christian, he would just start conversations and be like, yeah, I've been hanging out with these guys, like, and this is interesting stuff, you know? And 
And so, uh, and, and you know, the longer that he spent with us, you know, it, he was becoming more and more interested, going in the direction of believing. Um, and so that was uh, just a, a really great picture of what it means, um, you know, what discipleship can mean, um, the kind of walking alongside someone, whether or not they believe yet, and just um, bringing them into the community and how, um, yeah, and how, how it can happen in, in any order. Our Father, as we pause to worship through the giving of our money, may we be reminded of the blessings and love you give us. May we respond to your generosity with gratitude that exhibits itself with generous acts of kindness, an attitude of compassion, and a caring life that greets others with a generous smile, handshakes, and fist bumps given in a spirit of love. Thank you for loving us. Amen. A time for grace. A time for Trust in God to find my way when my doubts increase. A time to grieve, a time to see, to trust the Son. When 
stillness comes and sadness draws over me I'll choose to join his feast Friends, hear the word of the Lord from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Our good and our holy God, we are grateful for a chance this day to come to the feast of worship. We thank you, Lord, that even as we offer ourselves up to you as living sacrifices, that you feed us. From a banqueting table. As we lift our voices, Lord, you open your voice to us. We give because you give, and you give in worship. You give direction and correction and encouragement and instruction and inspiration. You give us hope and faith and love. You set before us a feast and you invite us to eat. Today, Lord, by faith, we choose to eat. Make us strong, O Lord, our God, that our lives would honor you, that our words and our deeds would point others to you, that we would be witnesses filled with your life and grace. God, this is our prayer in the mighty name of Jesus, and we pray together saying, amen and amen. Today's verse of scripture comes from Curtis Moore. You have been giving passages of scripture to me over the past several weeks, and I encourage you to continue to do that 
Uh, we certainly won't preach through all of them, but I, I treasure all of them and keep them, and they help me in my own devotional life. Today's is from Curtis. When Curtis turned this passage of Scripture in, he said about it, he said, Our lives are an open book. He mentioned that the Scripture reads us. Now, if you just think about that for a moment, that's just a little weird. I've been reading books since I could read. Write that one down. And books are wonderful things. And in a large measure, we control books. I typically have several going at one time, and I, and I put them down and pick them up, and, and I read them. I write in them. I argue with them. Sometimes I'm a little hesitant to loan out books because I've made some marginal notes that I may not want you reading. <laughs> in a large sense, we control our reading. We make the choices. But when we come to the Bible, something different happens if we come to it rightly. The Bible, through the Spirit of Christ, begins to read us. Now, if we're real honest, that's spooky. We don't want things reading us. We don't want things that we normally can count on to just be, to become alive. Remember Scooby-Doo shows when you were a kid? Some of you watch them as adults. That ages you a little bit. But I was a kid, I used to be frightened by the Scooby-Doo shows until they pulled the mask off the guy and it was just the high school janitor, you know. <laughs> but it seemed like in nearly ep every episode of Scooby-Doo, there would be a portrait on the wall that had eyes that moved. I've been scared of portraits my whole life because of Scooby-Doo. You're supposed to look at portraits. Portraits aren't supposed to look at you. The same is true for mirrors. In the morning, I wake up and I look in the mirror. I use the mirror to help me shave my face. My hairs are getting gray even here. I don't want to look like Santa Claus. So I shave my face every morning. I use the mirror to brush my teeth. Now, what if the mirror one morning looked at me and said, Hey, sport, you need to go back to bed. You need to rest up a little. You're looking kind of, kind of dogged. What if the mirror started to talk to me? That would be spooky, wouldn't it? That'd freak you out. It would be strange. It would be different. It would be, it would be mystical. It wouldn't be what we were used to in this grocery-getting day-by-day world. Well, when it comes to the Bible, I think we need a little spooky. I think we need a little out of the ordinary. I think it's okay for the Bible to be treated differently than other books because the Bible is different than other books. And because the Word of God is beyond just the book. It's living and breathing and there is life to it because God is alive. And we need, as followers of Jesus, we deeply, deeply need something more than what the senses can grasp. We need something alive from God. Theologian Cheryl Bridges John says that modern Christians, we suffer from an enchantment deficit disorder. She said, we hunger for great mystery. She said, the whole world has fallen prey to disenchantment and hungers for the mystery of Christ. God is alive and wants to commune with us and he wants us to experience him and we are caged in by our senses until we come to this text and it starts to read us. And the one that Curtis chose for us says exactly that, that the word of God is living and powerful. 
So what do you do when you discover something's wrong and, and out of place? Let's say she's right and we do have an enchantment deficit disorder. Well, you call time out, you slow it down, and you seek a remedy. So today, we're, during this sermon, we're just going to call a brief time out. And as my mother taught us, we're going to count to three. One, two, three. And in the counting, I'm going to offer you one, two, and three things for us to consider about this Word of God that is living and powerful. And how we can overcome this enchantment deficit that I truly believe we are experiencing. Okay, number one, if you're taking notes. We have to embrace one sacred and purpose. And this purpose comes from God. That's the greater context of the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is a letter. It's this long, continuous argument. And the argument is Christ is the true and the living way. Christ is superior. Christ is better than. Christ is life. Life is Christ. It's about one purpose the glory and the kingdom of God and living under the reign of King Jesus. It's more than just our personal salvation, although that's important. It's about the renewal of life. It's about the church. It's about the community. It's about God's work in this world. Theologian Thomas Smell said it like this, for what purpose are men saved and brought to God? In order that they may reveal his kingdom in its nearness and presence and by the witness of his lordship over every area of human life. The New Testament has less interest in the saved individual in and for himself than some of our traditions have led us to suppose. The end of God's action is the revelation of God's kingdom and glory rather than simply the personal impartation of salvation. What is God's purpose for you? Well, we might answer to be saved and to come to know him. That's true, but it's not true enough. Because he wants to take us as his restored and renewed individuals and use us to bear witness to his, his life and his hope and the kingdom and his reign over all the earth. We don't need to live a disenchanted life because God is up to something big. And if we name his name, we are grafted into that for his glory and for our good. We need one sacred purpose. You remember Jack Palance and City Slickers? You got to have one thing. We have one thing to seek ye first the kingdom of God. One. Two, if we want to overcome this enchantment deficit disorder, we've got to recognize that there is a union of two spirits. The spirit of God and our spirit. I love what the book of Romans says in 8 verse 16. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. We receive into our very being life, and that life is from God. We are spiritual beings. And God's spirit communes with our spirit because he loves us. We are spiritual. We don't have to be disenchanted because we live in the enchantment of a relationship with a living God. His spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are his children. The book of Proverbs chapter 20 verse 27 says this, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord 
searching all the innermost parts of his being. We are spiritual people. And God's spirit shines like a lantern in our heart. This is a, a large measure of what we talk about when we're talking about the word of God. We're talking about God shining his light on the inside of us. Coming in and doing his work. And God does this in our spirits. In our heart of hearts. In the deep places. And in our spirits we search the deep Things of God. We enter that great bathosphere and we go deep, deep down. And we can commune with God. Friends, we don't have to live a disenchanted life because God is alive. And this may come as a shock to you, but so are you. And your spirit, your spirit can commune with God. And there he whispers, you're my child. And there he shines his lantern and shows us who we really are. That's amazing. John Calvin said, whenever the Lord accosts us by his word, he is dealing seriously with us to affect all our inner senses. This is how the Word and the Spirit work. This is how God works. He brings to bear His truth through the living Spirit of Christ. Theologians call this the testimonium. Listen to these words from Bernard Ram. The union of word and spirit is the theological ground for the theory of testimonium. The Holy Spirit is the internal minister of the word who speaks the compelling and persuasive word to the human heart. When the word spoken by the external minister of the word penetrates the ear of the listener, the internal minister speaks to the heart. The Spirit efficaciously impresses the Word upon our hearts, and at that moment, the Word becomes to us the Word of life, for it is the function of the Spirit to enlighten and impress the heart with the Word. The Word reads us because God is alive. And so are we. And we are being renewed by our confession that Jesus Christ is Lord day by day and with each passing moment. Being renewed by His truth and by His way. One sacred person, purpose, two spirits. And now thirdly, I want us to look at the threefold Word of God. What do we mean when we say the Word of God. Well, when you look at the Bible, we mean some different things, but they're intimately intertwined. One of the things we mean when we say the Word of God is we mean Christ, the living Christ. John 1 in that great prologue talks about the Word and how the Word made all that is made. That Word is Christ. In the opening of the book of Hebrews, this is what we hear. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds. We talk about Christ when we talk about the Word of God. I think it's interesting how things pivot in 12 and 13. In 12, for the Word of God is living and powerful, sharper, and then we have it in 13, and there is no creature hidden from His sight. When we speak of the Word, we speak of Christ. When we speak of the Word, we also speak of Scripture. 
I love what our friend Kimlin Bender said. He said, Scripture is the basis for the church's teaching precisely because Scripture stands not only within the church, but also over it as the voice of the first divinely appointed witnesses. It shares the authority of the prophets and the apostles, and moreover, as the written witness of these witnesses, it serves as the voice of Christ for the church in the present. The Word of God is the voice of Christ. It's like the cherubim on the mercy seat. Everything in the Old Testament looking forward and bowing in reverence to Christ that would come. And everything in the New looks back at Christ bowing in reverence for all that he has done, for all that he is, and then points us toward the promises that he has made regarding the future. The Scriptures, the book of Christ, the voice of Christ for us. Here's a third in the threefold word, and that's proclamation. That's the bearing witness of the word, flesh on flesh, person to person, either in small gatherings or private conversations or in an assembly like this. There is the proclamation of the word by the faithful followers of Christ that serves in this word as the word of the Lord. This is how Karl Barth said it. He said, through the new robe of righteousness thrown over it, that is the scripture, even in its earthly character, it becomes a new event. The event of God's own speaking in the sphere of earthly events. The event of the authoritative vicariat of Jesus Christ. Real proclamation as this new event in which the event of human talk is not set aside by God, but exalted is the word of God. Again, then real proclamation means the word of God is preached. Only now it is clear that preached belongs to the predicate. And to what degree? The word of God preached means in this fourth and innermost circle, man's talk about God in which and through which God speaks about himself. In teaching and in preaching and in sharing and in singing the word, an event happens. And it's a God event. And in that event, God speaks to our hearts. And we have to choose. We have to choose his way or another way. In the proclamation, in the faithful proclamation of the word of God, the word has a chance to read us. Now, I stand up here a very, very human human. So these words are my words. But there's some amazing grace that happens as God will wrap a robe around the faltering offerings of human beings and walk among us again. That's amazing. When I was a young pastor, I would stand in the back of the church and people would come out and they would say, well, you really stepped on my toes today, pastor. And I would be very sanctimonious and I would say, well, I was aiming for your heart. I must have missed. <laughs> and, uh, and they would go on and on and on. And then, you know, they were very grateful about this or that or the other. And, and I would be very sanctimonious and, uh, and I would say, well, it was all the Lord. It was none of me. Uh, until I heard a story, this was happening to a young pastor, and, and a guy came up after somebody did that, and he made that kind of response, and the guy said, well, son, it wasn't that good. <laughs> <laughs> so there's something earthy about this. I mean, I can pray, hide me behind the cross that they may not see me. That'd be a lot of wood, guys. <laughs> You're always going to see the preacher. You're always going to see the witness. You're always going to see the one that shares. But here's the miracle. Here's the enchantment of it all. That God, God likes foolishness and has chosen the foolishness of proclamation to speak to his children and say live. One, two, three.
two, three. Maybe I should give you four applications. I'll do it quickly. Friends, we got to read the scriptures. We've got to read the word of God. Jack Deere said the main reason the Bible is ineffective in the lives of so many Christians is that they simply don't read it. I think we revere the Bible far more than we read it. Go get a cheap paperback Bible and write all over it. Get swimming pool water on it. Read it like you would read a cheap novel. Read it for pleasure and joy. And you know what? God just might show up in the middle of that. We've got to read the Bible. That's one. Number two, we got to show up with other Christians. We've got to assemble ourselves together. That great word of Hebrews 10, 25, don't quit gathering together. And when we come together, we bear witness to the word together. We speak the word of God to each other. And when we are in that environment where we are preaching the word to each other and hearing the word from each other, we are encouraged, corrected, instructed, trained, inspired. Keep showing up. This really isn't that hard, these first two. Read the Bible. Show up at church. The third one, seek the anointing of the Spirit when it is your opportunity to be the one teaching and sharing and preaching. There's more to it than just prep. You got to read, you got to know, you got to understand, but you got to bring your heart before the God of this universe and lay it bare. Because we're all laid bare before the Word. Before the Word of God, we are naked. As we used to say in the South, we are naked. And so bring your naked selves before God and say, God, search me. Identify those places that I cherish smallness and selfishness and sin. God, God, see me as I am and cleanse me and touch me with your grace and with your power, if you're someone who teaches, seek the presence of God. Frank Level said the Spirit of God should be wooed and implored. Martin Lloyd-Jones said the unction, the anointing, it's the supreme thing. Seek it until you have it. Be content with nothing left. And the fourth thing, adjust to the Word of God. When things that you think should be dead come alive and startle you, you should probably pay attention. When those eyes in the art gallery start to follow you, you're going to adjust your behavior. If my mirror ever said, get back in bed, you know what I'd do? I'd get back in bed. <laughs> and when the Bible reads us having read the Bible, and the word of God is spoken. Turn. The truly spiritual life is a penitent life. It's a penitent life. And there is joy and there is life in the midst of that. So today, this day, I invite us all to turn fresh again to the Lord. And we all have stuff to turn from and hand over. So where you're seated as we sing, and I invite you to stand now. Ask God to, to search your heart and give him those things that you need to hand over. Today as we sing this hymn of commitment, you may need to turn toward him by making this church, your church, a place for you to worship and serve, a place for you to be encouraged and instructed. Today, it may be that you would follow Christ, that you don't know how to do that. It's all, a, it's all very foggy to you, and you need somebody to help you talk it out. That might be you today. Whatever God is stirring in your spirit, respond for his glory and for your good. And let's respond as we sing.
Please be seated. I'd like to invite my friends uh, Chris Davis and Carly McLaughlin to come and join me here at the front. Chris and Carly are a young couple engaged to be married next year, and they have been visiting here with us at First Baptist Waco for a number of weeks now. Uh, Chris is in sales here in Waco. Carly is an engineer out at SpaceX, and so if you live just a little bit south of here, she may have rattled your windows. <laughs> But they have been uh, visiting with us for a while and come this morning uh, with the belief that the Spirit has led them to place their membership here at First Baptist, offer themselves as candidates for membership. And Chris and Carly, we want to say welcome to you. Uh, we want to let you know that we are excited you're here with us and want to be your church family. We want to promise to you and covenant with you to uh, pray with you, to support you, to walk alongside you uh, as you follow the Lord. And so others will want to say that uh, more personally. I invite you to come after our benediction, greet them, introduce yourself to them. But first, uh, if you join me in making those promises and rejoice that Chris and Carly are here with us, would you say amen? Amen. amen. Chris and Carly, I'll let y'all grab a seat for just a second, and Robin will come and bring us our benediction. Hear this benediction from the book of Hebrews. Now the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. 